Reading through the Bible in one year, September 18th, 2 Samuel 20 through 21, Romans 6, 15 through 725, Ezekiel 11, and Psalms 93 through 94. Now there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, they followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. So all the men of Israel, I already said that, and David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house, and put them in a house under guard, and provided for them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. That's not punishment for them, it's because they had been, um, it's because his son had slept with them. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together uh, to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed for him. And David said uh, to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do uh, more harm, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And then, sorry, and there went out. After him, Joab's men, and the Carathites and the Palathites, and all the mighty men. And they went out from Jerusalem to, perf- to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now, Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it uh, was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, it, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe that the sword was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails on the ground without striking a second blow. And he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Um, and Joab, one of Joab's young men, took his stand by Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever's for David, Uh, is for David, let him follow Joab. And Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the highway. And anyone who came by, seeing him, stopped. And when they saw, sorry, and when the man saw that all the people stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and threw a garment over him. When he was taken out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. And Sheba uh, passed through all the tribes of Israel, to Abel um, of Beth Maacah. And all the Bichrites assembled and followed him in. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel Beth of Maacah. And they cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart. And they were battering the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman from the city um, called out and said, Listen, listen. Tell Joab, come here, that I may speak with you. And he came near her, and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I am listening. She said, They used to say in former uh, times, Let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled the matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? Joab answered, Far be it from me. Far be it that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be uh, be thrown down to you over the wall. And the woman went, Uh, to all the people in her wisdom. And they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, every man to his home. And Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Now Joab was in command of the army of, sorry, of all the army of Israel. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the Carathites and the Palathites. And Adoram was in charge of the forced labor. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Alihud, 
uh, sorry, Ahilud was the recorder. Shiva was the secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira, the Jairite, was also David's priest. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for uh, three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So they, rather, so the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were uh, not of a, not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought had sought to strike them down in his zeal uh, for the people of Israel and Judah. So he was violating the uh, covenant that they had made with the um, Amorites. And David said to the Gibeonites. What shall I do for you, and how shall I make atonement, that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? And the Gibeonite said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us, and Saul or his house. Nor, sorry, neither is, is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, well, What do you say that I shall do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us, so that we should uh, have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be given to us, that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And king, uh, sorry, and the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, uh, the daughter of Aah, whom she bore to Saul, um, Armonia and Mephibosheth. Um, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the uh, Meholathite, and gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, um, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aah, took sackcloth, there you go. And spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the rain fell upon them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the beasts of the field by night. When David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aah, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son, Jonathan, from the men of Jabesh Gilead, uh, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shun, where the Philistines had hanged them. And on the uh, day the Philistines, sorry, on the day that the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa, and he brought them up from there, rather, and he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who were hanged together, and they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zila, in the tomb of Kish, his father. And they did all that the king commanded, and after that, God resp uh, responded to the plea for the land. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel, and David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. And Ishbi Benob, or Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of bronze, and he was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, You shall no longer go out with us to battle lest you quench the lamp of Israel. After this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and, and uh, Sibachai, the Hushathite, struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jared Oregim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, um, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. This is a different um, Goliath. And there was again war, war, war at Gath, um, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He also was descended from the giants. Um, and when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now Romans six fifteen through seven twenty five. 
I'm going to try to keep this short today. Let's see how I do. So we just learned that we are now no longer under the law, right? Um, we exist under the law. We observe the law, but we are not under it for condemnation, right? Um, the law no longer has any authority over us because the authority that the law would exercise is to bring those people who violate it to death, but we have already died to that law, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members, again, body parts, members, um, as slaves to impurity, and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members, again, body parts, as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Another way to see this is um, you physically went off to go and sin. That's how you used to do things before. Don't do that anymore because you don't have to. Instead, Use your body parts to physically go and do things that glorify God. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't have to do that which was righteous, because you didn't want to do that which is righteous. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, is death. but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. We were married to the law. We now have died and we are set free from the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. See, there's an order here. We have been raised, so we have died to the law, right? We are no longer under the, the law to, to crush us anymore. It no longer has authority over us. But we now are reborn. Why? In order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, before we became Christians, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members, in our bodies, to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. This isn't a sign that there's some sort of Bible code in the Bible. It's, it's talking about the law. What then shall we say? Is the law sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Again, that's that codification, right? Knowing what the law is, you know it in your heart, but it wasn't written down, so now that's written down, so now we can look at it and go, yeah, okay, I'm clearly sinning. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. 
But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good, right? Because it's God, it's God's holy standard. But sin that's alive within us knows what the law is and leads us to want to violate it. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin. So it's not that, that the law itself produces sin. It's that the sin that lives within us, when we hear the law, when we know the law, again, when we want to violate our consciences, when we're not Christians, um, we know that it's wrong, and that's what makes it enticing. That's why we want to do it. That's why we want to pursue those things, right? But it is not the law that brings sin. It's not the law that causes this to happen. It's sin. That's what's doing it. It produces death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am on the but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin, right? Before we are Christians, we are not spiritual beings. We might think we're spiritual. We might feign spirituality, right? But that doesn't mean we're an actual spiritual being. We're not, um, our DNA is basically rewritten when we become a Christian. So then we can truly communicate with God. That's the kind of thing that happens. That's the spirit that is now indwelling us. That's what we're talking about. But before that, we don't have that spirit indwelling us. The only spirit we have within us is ourselves. And that is of the flesh. It's sold under sin. For I do not under- understand my own actions. Now, before I go into this, this is, this is one of those things I keep going back to. Because, as I mentioned before, when you struggle with sin, when you commit sin, and you um, start thinking, man, am I really a Christian? I just did that thing. Or why do I still want to do this thing that I've been doing before? Or why can't I break this habit? Why am I continuing to, uh, continuing to struggle with that? Right? This is something that all of us endure. And once you counter this one sin... Don't worry. You've got a lot more back there. You may think that this one thing is the only thing you're focusing on that's the hardest thing for you to break, but the minute that you get past that, there's a laundry list of other stuff. But God is kind and he's going to reveal those to you one at a time and he's going to work on it with you. And he's going to absolutely give you times that you are going to be struggling. And absolutely, you're going to be hitting these times over and over and over in your life And some that you thought were dead and gone, they're going to rear their head at some point further on down the road because that's how it happens. We get complacent and sin can pop back up again. But this is the struggle of a Christian. And I used to think, I wish that I was, you know, I wish that I was like Paul or Peter or John or Luke, or all of these people who lived with Jesus. And then, obviously, these guys are saints, right? Obviously, these guys are the apostles. They were the direct disciples of Jesus the Christ. They were there with him. Purely, based on that alone, they never would have sinned after, you know, after Jesus' death and resurrection. They never, no. This is why I keep coming back to this, because it's a reminder that our life here on earth is a continual struggle against sin. And we're going to keep battling against that sin. How long? Until we pass through that veil of death. But that battle reminds you that you are a Christian. Don't give in. Don't back down from that. Because that battle reminds you 
that you're still in the fight. Let's see what Paul has to say on this. For I do not understand my own actions. What? (laughs) This guy is the apostle to the Gentiles, right? This is the guy who started a bunch of churches and who helped bolster them and helped them put in elders, right? What does this even mean that he doesn't understand his own actions? For I do not do what I want, but I do, I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do not do what I want, I agree with the law that it is good. The law exists to remind us and show us God's holy standard so that when we violate it, we can go, I'm in the wrong. Right? So now it is no longer I who do it, meaning him and himself. He doesn't want to do it. But he's being led along. He's giving in to his sin. It's the sin that dwells in him that is doing it. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. This doesn't mean we give in all the time. It means it's a battle. It means it's a daily battle. And when we slip, when we sin, when we do things that we know are wrong, we repent. And we thank God and we believe in what he has said, that he has delivered us from these things. And we pick up and we keep going. His mercy is new every single day. We get up the next morning and we start over. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. We continue to struggle against sin every single moment of every single day. We're going to fail. But it's like I said yesterday. It's the trajectory. We don't give into it every single day. We don't go, oh, well, you know, I can give into it now because tomorrow I'll start better. No. We continue to fight against it. And when we slip, then we slip. Then we're going to get up and start over again. Christian life is not perfection. But our goal is to be like Christ. Knowing that when we pass through that veil of death, We can finally rest from this struggle because we will be with Christ and we will sin no more. Let's go to Ezekiel 11. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the house of the Lord, which faces east. And behold, at the entrance of the gateway, there were 25 men. And I saw among them uh, Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pel... uh, Sorry, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are men who devise iniquity and who give wicked counsel in this city, who say, The time is not near to build houses. The city is a is the cauldron, we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me. And he said to me, Say, Thus says the Lord. So you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the city and have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in in the midst of it, they are the meat, and this city is the cauldron, but you shall be brought out of the midst of it. 
You have feared the sword, and I will bring the sword upon you, declares the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst of it and give you into the hand of foreigners and execute judgments on you. And you shall fall by the sword, and I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in the midst of it. I will judge you at, I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. And it came to pass while I was prophesying that Peltiel, sorry, Pelatia, the son of Benaiah, died. And I fell down on my face and cried out with a loud voice and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you make a full end of the remnant of Israel? And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, your brothers, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord. To us this land is given for a possession. Therefore say, there's, sorry, thus says the Lord God. Though I have removed them from far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have a sanctuary to them. So I, I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you um, that I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove it, rather, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. And I will remove the heart of, um, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. This is what happens when you become a Christian, right? It's a whole heart transformation. You, you stop being the person who you were, and now you are a different person. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings, with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in the vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to the exiles. Then the vision that I had seen went up for me. And I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. Now Psalm 93 through 94. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Psalm 94. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words. All evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. They say, the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? 
He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord, knows the thoughts of man, that they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. All who rises up for me against the wicked, rather, who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against the evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. This is in death. When I thought, my foot slips. Your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them their iniquity and wipe, out, or wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord, our God, will wipe them out. Behold the word of the Lord.